Berlin that helps people understand what's going on behind their screens. And we curated this exhibition you see here called The Glass Room. If you don't know what The Glass Room is, you're in it right now. It's a pop-up exhibition that gives you tangible ways to understand sort of abstract concepts about data and privacy. So we have artworks, videos, animations, hands-on tools, <coughs> toolkits. It's all to help you understand night until Sunday when the exhibition um, I'd remind you all to silence your phones <laughs> um, these talks and discussions they're a chance to kind of delve deeper into some of the issues that are raised by the exhibits you see outside and also to bring your voices and questions into the conversation as well so tonight we're lucky to have two amazing speakers who are deeply steeped in researching and reporting on the opaque infrastructures and decision-making processes that determine what we see and what we don't see online. Um, Casey Newton is the Silicon Valley editor at The Verge. His daily newsletter, The Interface, is my lifeline to tech news, so if you're not a <laughs> subscriber, I highly recommend it. It's the most comprehensive digest of all the breaking stories around the intersection of big tech, society, democracy, and social media. And every day it begins with Casey's incredibly incisive and insightful commentary about the biggest tech stories in the day's news. Um, I don't know how he does it on a daily basis. I love you, Christy. Thank you. <laughs> I love you, too. Um, Casey has also been on fire this past year. He not only published the leaked audio of Mark Zuckerberg's internal Facebook meetings recently, he also... Re yes. Cheers to that. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> He also researched and published a groundbreaking expose about the working conditions for content moderators in the US called The Trauma Floor. So if you haven't read it, then I suggest you Google it or, or use some other browser. Um, Firefox. <laughs> Firefox, for instance. His reporting has uh, single-handedly sparked national conversations about these issues. Um, Clara Tsao is a national security and technology entrepreneur. Clara Sao. Mm -hmm. Clara has been a fellow with the Mozilla Foundation, where she examines the impacts of policies related to content moderation, online disinformation, and terrorist content. Clara is also a fellow with the German Marshall Fund, focused on election security and foreign influence operations. She previously served as the Senior Advisor for Emerging Technology at the Department of Homeland Security and as Chief Technology Officer of the U.S. government's Countering Violent Extremism and Countering Foreign Influence Task Force. Wow. And to top it off, she is also the president of the board of the White House Presidential Innovation Fellows Foundation. So I'm looking forward to hear what they both have to say, so please welcome Casey and Clara. Thank you. Uh, I have to say, I'm, I'm super curious, like, who is our audience tonight? Uh, so I just kind of wanted to see, just mostly so we could, like, sort of set our, our expectations for maybe how and, and what we should explain. Uh, how many people uh, just sort of, like, wandered in off of the street or just visiting the classroom tonight and don't really know much about content moderation? It's okay. Okay, awesome, fantastic. Uh, how many people sort of, like, work in tech or tech adjacent? Cool. Uh, anybody work specifically on issues of um, sort of like policy or content moderation? Okay, fantastic. Uh, and anybody in here read the interface, my newsletter? Just curious. Okay, awesome. Y'all are my people. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'll be around after if you just want to say hi. I would love to meet you. Um, I'm super excited to be talking with Clara. Uh, I didn't know Clara before last week. We had an amazing coffee, caught up. Turns out we're obsessed with basically all of the exact same things. So today I'm hoping we can... Uh, uh, talk about a lot of really interesting stuff, uh, and then get to your questions. Um, uh, I think it's important, uh, and, and Claire reminded me that it's important, that we start off at the very highest level, particularly for folks who are just joining us, maybe because you, you visited the exhibition tonight, to talk about what is content moderation, what are the components? Clara, how do you think about it? Yeah, no, absolutely. So I think in order for us to talk about content moderation, we should deep dive into the history of how it first started. 
So if you guys were on AOL chat rooms back in the day, there were volunteer moderators uh, years and years ago when there were less user-generated content online that would spend their time volunteering to flag what was appropriate and what was inappropriate. It was a really community-driven process, and there are still companies that do this today, like Wikipedia, when you think about content that stays up and taken down, it's run completely by users. As there became more and more user-generated content, companies started to hit what's known as crisis moments. They start dealing with child pornography on their sites, they started to deal with terrorist content, and they started to deal with Russian influence operations in the most recent years. And for them, it became really hard to really evaluate content at scale. And so many of them, the larger ones especially, uh, couldn't do it alone, and they started to, to build what's known as trust and safety teams, uh, which are professionals that define and determine acceptable policies of content and what gets to stay on and what gets to be removed. Um, but those teams also reached an escalation point where they really needed more people looking at content. And they started to outsource it out to uh, vendor firms like Cognizant, Event, uh, Accenture. These are firms that Casey has talked to and a number of individuals that Casey has interviewed in a lot of his pieces, where uh, unfortunately there are pretty bad labor conditions that often comes with the work that is associated with viewing hours and hours of content every day, especially ones that might be particularly traumatizing that's flagged by users. Can from I pause and ask you a question based on that? Yep. Um, something like, so uh, once like Facebook, YouTube, these big platforms decided that they needed to outsource this work and go hire vendors, they had a lot of money to spend, right? Like one of the contracts I wrote about, I think was a $200 million contract. Um, it is not clear to me that any of these consulting firms remotely knew how to do any of this work at the beginning. I think they literally were like, $200 million? Yeah, we'll figure it out. We will come up with something. And so they took the call center model, which is the same model that, you know, if your refrigerator is broken and you call Best Buy, uh, they took that exact same setup and then ported it over to, here's Facebook's community standards, now like go apply that to a billion people. Is that also your understanding? Or? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I will start off actually with the makeup of most trust and safety teams. So a lot of people that end up at trust and safety really fall into two buckets. People that work in spam or customer support in the early days of, uh, of most platforms and then they get pulled to say, oh, deal with other types of reporting that happen. So those are really the early content moderators that form one bucket. The other are actually IP lawyers that are used to making decisions in the gray. And there's more and more content, and there's content that you might argue, is this actually nudity or is it not, right? If yeah. nudity is not allowed, is anime porn nudity? So it became more and more complex. And so companies started to develop uh, what's known as terms of service and acceptable community policies on their platforms. And they started off quite small, and started to grow really expansive. And so the people that KC mentions are people that have to read these policies and then day to day manually determine um, by these policies what to keep up and what to take down. Um, so your question specifically was around how it got organized, right? And I think with most companies, that, to my understanding, when you don't know what to do, you hire a consulting firm. It's yeah. not your fault, it then becomes a consulting firm. That's right. It's a pretty typical model to me. Yeah. Um, but I don't think anyone knew what they were doing. I mean, this is a growing, emerging field. It's a new professional field. And you yeah. can argue who knew what they were doing in the early, early days of privacy, right? Right. So already you have identified this, this tension at the heart of content moderation, which I think about constantly, which is on one hand, we all agree that if there is terrorism, child porn, uh, all that really, really bad stuff on the platform, it will die and quickly, right? Like it is an emergency when that stuff is on the platform. And yet, when it came to how are we going to get it off our platform, all of the big platforms said, we are gonna have a consultant go figure that out, right? And I think you would also agree, Clara, that most of the, the people doing this work historically uh, have not, been valued. Um, it has not been seen as a career trajectory, right? Why is it that this work has been so undervalued historically? Yeah, um, so I, I explained a little bit about the history earlier, but most people still see content moderation today as a volunteer position. Mm. There's still people that spend hours on Wikipedia trying to moderate what they think is great. You see this on message boards. So on 4chan, there's actually an army of volunteers um, that are called janitors. 
And the question is, do we respect people that we call janitors, that we name and call janitors? Um, when we start paying them, will they still be respected, right? And a lot of that comes not just pressure from platforms, understanding and respecting these teams that are created to make some of the hardest decisions on their platforms, um, but really ensuring that this profession is viewed as a profession. Yeah. It is not something that you can go in and then replace really quickly. There is sophistication in the process and that it is a field that continues to be more and more complex. Yes, uh, you know, and we should say like, you know, we, we should uh, respect all janitors and like all other working people who are like working hard doing whatever they're doing, right? Um, but as you point out, this work carries a level of technical sophistication that I think is often um, not considered, right? And leads to all kinds of uh, secondary problems. Although, you know, maybe we can talk about our, our companies um, starting to wise up around that and, and maybe change their views. So you worked in the government. Uh, what, what did you learn there about content information, uh, influence operations? Is our, is our government good at catching this stuff? We've got an election coming up. Are you, are you staying up at night thinking about this? What, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, I think everyone's figuring it out. I mean, you have platforms trying to determine what to do. You have teams in U.S. government um, after 2016 that were formed to really tackle what happens when people are pushing disinformation around places like the census, right? The census actually controls so much of how budget is allocated in the U.S. There's more and more threats of disinformation. Which should we explain uh, what that is maybe for folks who are catching up to what disinformation is? Yeah, um, of course. So disinformation is uh, false information with the intent to cause harm. And so a simple example of this, and this is what Claire Wardle, um, a researcher in this space, defines it as, uh, is Russian bots, right? They were created um, by the Internet Research Agency back in 2016, and there were actually physical protests that took place in communities all across America um, that were protesting against for Muslim and anti-Muslim rights that were completely fiction and created by the Internet Research Agency. But, but, but real Americans went to them. They were just created by bots. Exactly. Yeah. Um, they were created by bots. And then the second category is uh, misinformation. And misinformation is really false information that people unknowingly spread that actually causes harm. And that includes conspiracy theories. So I might think that the anti-vax movement is great. There's obviously a lot of science that proves it, but I keep reading online and you know, in the eco chambers that are created today by AI um, and, and, and the advertising, um, it becomes really easy for me to always find someone that has my perspective and really believe that that is the source of truth. Right. And then the third category is malinformation. And malinformation really actually means information that is actually true, but people actually misinterpret it and it caused harm at the end of the day. And some examples of this uh, actually happening in 2014 is a case study called the Louisiana, Louisiana uh, chemical attack in which the internet research agency at that time created a false campaign targeting journalists and a number of people in Louisiana to say there was a chemical plant that exploded. And um, people actually took real footage from other explosions and started circulating them online. So you can't actually say this information is fake. This information actually is real content. But we see this over and over again in how sometimes news broadcast media and you realize that's a picture. It's not a fake one. It's not generated by computers, but it is reused from a news cycle that happened 10 years ago. Yeah, I mean, another classic one that you see a lot is like, oh, look at these like protesters beating up a police officer and it's from like another other protests like 10 years ago, but some state is going to tweet it out and use it as a pretext for, you know, cracking down on nonviolent protesters, that sort of thing. Um, so there's, yeah, so these, uh, so there's these sort of three big categories. You were was like working on the, these issues of the government. Like, like what, what were you working on and how far did you get? Yeah, um, a lot of my work, um, I can kind of cover the two bases. Um, and I can actually start maybe on where I got started even before government. Yeah. There was an accidental exposure to this, uh, even before I knew I was gonna work on this. I was at Microsoft for several years, and one of the areas that I actually took on was leading a project in Myanmar back in 2014 on information integrity. And at that time, a number of people, I was, uh, I was working with civil society groups, media organizations, government officials, they started to tell me that there was a lot of fake information that was spreading on Facebook. And Facebook at the time had zero people that spoke Burmese. And Myanmar, for context, is actually a country that's twice the size of Canada in population. 
and they speak hundreds of different languages, but Facebook chose a language that became the standard of how most people speak online there today. And that comes with the power and responsibility that most platforms, I don't know if they know this, uh, have over the rest of the world. They dictate how people in Myanmar search for information online. Um, so what quickly happened is um, there is a small ethnic group that has been targeted by the Burmese government um, that is now undergoing an ethnic genocide over a number of polarizing things that took place on the ground since 2014. And these are irreversible damages to a country under very strict dictatorship. And I remember thinking in my head, you know, this is such an incredible topic that's gonna shape how we think about the world this century. But it will not actually wake the rest of the world up until it hits a Western democracy. And that's when everyone woke up to it in 2016. Um, I decided to join US government through a program called the White House Presidential Innovation Fellows, which brings the smartest entrepreneurs and technologists from the private sector to do a term of service in US government. And when I was there, I was uh, recruited to serve as the chief technology officer of an interagency team focused on countering violent extremism. So how do people get radicalized here in the US? Why, do they, why have 30,000 Americans gone overseas to join groups like ISIS? Uh, and how does content actually play a role in that? And a lot of this was really complicated, not just for uh, people within government, but even the, the companies outside of it. When they're served law enforcement requests, they have no idea what is lawful and what's not. Um, you have smaller platforms that have no idea or no staff, no trust and safety teams to deal with terrorist content. You have no coordination among companies to share information. So it wasn't until uh, late 2016, early 2017, that companies started to form one of the first information sharing mechanisms uh, after child sexual exploitation online. So they formed a committee called the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism, where for the first time, companies could share with each other. Uh, but that doesn't actually help as much the smaller platforms that are housing, housing t uh, ISIS propaganda, like a company called Just Pace It, which was a graduate school project of one student who decided he wanted to create a cool file sharing forum, uh, had no idea how to detect content, and he's not a counterterrorism or terrorist specialist. So these are the grappling questions that a number of agencies were facing, and a lot of them also are not on the platforms. They're not thinking about behavior. They're not thinking about, hey, if I see someone who's uh, committing to do a mass shooting on Snapchat, how, when another student captures that video, what's gonna happen, right? How do we think about public safety and all of this? So those are the questions that um, I was grappling with. And then- Yeah, it, yeah. and one of those, by the way, you sort of said you, you wrestled with what role does content play in spawning terrorism? Like, do, do we have an answer? Like, is there an answer to, like, how many uh, videos does YouTube have to recommend to you before you say, well, you know what, I am gonna join ISIS? <laughs> You know, I wish I had those answers, right? And that's why it's really hard because with, with ISIS actually, to use it as an example, I call it one of the most sophisticated marketing campaigns the world has ever seen. Through pure media, you're able to evoke fear, you're gonna get people to literally throw their lives on, into war to fight for a cause that they believe in. So it is incredibly powerful. But one of the biggest wake-up calls with ISIS content to most platforms, including YouTube, was that there are precursors to radicalization that they didn't realize they needed to also remove. So a simple example of this is a guy named Anwar Alaki, who was a sermon uh, who really had a strict interpretation of the Quran. And he was an American who would talk about interpreting the Quran in a very violent way. And his content was actually, his YouTube videos stayed on for a very long time, but was a huge precursor to why people joined ISIS. But that's not black and white, right? That does, that's not the man expressing videos. his religious beliefs, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's just protecting and, and you know, pushing his First Amendment rights. And so it took a very long time for activist groups alongside law enforcement to really tell and teach platforms that this was something that they should do something about. And having enough data to really get some of that content removed. Yeah, I mean, so we sort of hit this question now of like, you know, one of the questions that I have for you is, why was everyone so caught off guard for this? And part of me thinks that there was always going to have to be some sort of calamity before we realized like the negative consequences, right? On the flip side of it though, um, actually I read about this in my newsletter today. So uh, there was a new report out today warning of the spread of hate speech in, uh, in India, uh, the Assam uh, state. 
And, um, and I went back to a report that the, the UN High Commission had put out after it went back and studied what happened in Myanmar. And it said, you know, one thing that a platform could do before it entered a new market is to conduct a human rights impact assessment, which sounds like, like the wonkiest, like nerdiest thing, you know? But also, God, I wish Facebook had done that in like every country it had entered, particularly in ones where it didn't speak the language or didn't have moderators, right? So anyway, um, I'm rambling a bit, but your thoughts. So can you repeat the question? Yeah, the there wasn't one. I, I lost okay, it so wh why, were, why were platforms so caught off guard by this? And, and wh actually, uh, let, let's uh, spice it up a little bit. Who is caught more off guard, platforms or the government? Mm. I think they're both caught off guard. And oh, so she, she ducked it. I know, I just gave the most political answer. This mm -hmm. is what you learn in politics, how to answer yeah. a question where it pleases everyone, <laughs> right? Well done. Um, <laughs> So um, I, think, I think both sides were caught off guard. I think on one side, a lot of governments are still frustrated at companies like Facebook, uh, right, primarily because when it comes to ranking of what they do about particular threats, they do prioritize Western nations more than others, right? They have a country manager in most large companies that deals with government requests, and most of the time they'll, they'll not respond to those because they may not have operational procedures in place to respond. Um, in terms of information sharing, uh, there were very limited mechanisms for U.S. government to share out information that they see and also coordination at the local level. So for everyone here that has voted in the past, election security is quite complicated and a lot of people m mix it up together. So I did want to make sure I'm talking about it in the right way. The first is actually people who do not trust the secu physical security of election systems. And this can mean, you know, I don't believe in e-voting you know, e or the physical ballot might actually have some kind, of, um, some kind of harm to it in which my vote doesn't actually count. The second bucket is actually around disinformation of how you actually go about to vote. And so it could be uh, messaging that goes, you can text to vote. Uh, there might not be malintent from this from you know, Russia, but it could be uh, different groups pushing against each other on a campaign level. Um, this also could mean like you might need special ID in order for you to vote. So there's a degree of voter suppression that also happens. And that's still a type of information most companies have to deal with. The third bucket is actually around this broader issue of disinformation, right? When Russia has a campaign that pushes narratives to polarize the US, and most of the time, the goal of a Russian disinformation campaign isn't to say one side or the other, it's to push Americans so far against each other that they realize that their, their vote and their voice may not matter. That's the goal of most disinformation campaigns, is to get people to no longer care to participate in a democracy. So right. under that, I would say, I think a lot of people were, were not prepared. I mean, I think all three buckets, when you think about the technology infrastructure of the US and why I joined government, it was because a lot of the infrastructure that supports most US government functions are not great. And yeah. um, they have people that are still upkeeping SharePoint 2003, um, you know, in their servers. Which was and one so of the worst versions of SharePoint. I think we can all agree. <laughs> yeah, he gets it. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I think there's no more problem. I, I think the same thing on the company side. How do you expect a company to suddenly know everything about election security, right? So we see a lot of companies start hiring for new roles in areas that they are not specialists in. They're not- To, to say the very least, yeah. <laughs> right? The meme sharing platform doesn't have an election security person. Yeah, yeah. so- um, yeah. So, so that's exactly, um, that's, that's the way that I would say is, unfortunately these threats, these threats that we see in an offline environment, they're, they're hurting and actually you know, influencing people online and we need people who know the knowledge of this world um, in companies. Yes. And, and that becomes really hard, especially if you're a small company, it becomes really tough when you're a large company that have bureaucratic processes. So I, and then it becomes really hard when you're a government who's dealing with antiquated processes. Yes, and to draw back to something we talked about at the beginning, uh, uh, this sort of work has been some of the most undervalued work to take place at any of the platforms for a very long time and was mostly considered a volunteer job until it was way too late, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of um, what, what most people don't realize is a lot of trust and safety teams also have to push, even if they have the right intent and heart to do the right thing to protect users, they're still pushing against advertising teams who are looking at their bottom line. And if you're a shareholder or you're the CEO of a company, you're going to care about that bottom line more than you're going to care about protecting users in the first place, right? Yeah. So that's something that also happens, you know, the push against engineering support to be able to automate a lot of processes for content removal, you know, the emergence of AI 
AI and machine learning in the mix and how that might impact the way that you, you undercut processes. Yeah. So let's, let's do a little live content moderation here. Everybody oh can sort God. of play along. Uh, okay, so let's say that there is like a sort of large uh, social platform where uh, you know people can share their thoughts with one another, uh, and let's say a politician wants to take out an advertisement on that platform uh, to you know uh, to stir up their base, right? And let's say that in this ad uh, there is an obvious uh, lie, like just something a deeply untrue, sort of just empirically false thing. Um, how many people, just by show of hands, think that uh, it is the responsibility of the platform to take that ad down? Okay. And how many people think uh, that the platform should leave it up? Okay, all right, cool. But do you think that it should be flagged as a lie? Okay, so leave it up, but say, hey, they're lying. No, I appreciate you saying that because you know there, there are sort of multiple approaches to this topic. So for the past couple of weeks, uh, I imagine many of you may have seen, we've been having this exact debate about Facebook, which recently changed uh, its advertising policy uh, so that uh, if a politician uh, says something that is wrong, uh, that ad cannot be sent to a fact checker. And this uh, very predictable and yet still funny thing happened yesterday where a man in California said, I am going to run for governor <laughs> and I have one thing on my platform. I want to lie on Facebook ads. So he filed his paperwork to run and announced his intention uh, to spend the rest of the campaign lying on, on Facebook ads. And um, so, you know, I, we, we, write, we all write this up. We have a good laugh about this. But then there's actually a very interesting question, which is what should Facebook do about this, right? Because Facebook has said, and has taken out many op-eds and has given many speeches to say, we believe in the sanctity of the democratic process. We believe that politicians should be able to say what they're gonna say. We're gonna put a very few limits on it, but for the most part, it should be up to the citizens of the democracy to determine uh, what they wanna do with the information that the politician is a liar, right? I, I'm actually like relatively sympathetic to this view. Um, and then you have a person come up and say, I'm gonna do nothing but relentlessly lie on your platform for the entire campaign. Um, and so Facebook said today, and, I, and I, we, we do not have a lot of details on this. Is like, this is breaking news, which is why I wanted to bring it up, because I wanted you guys to have something you know, uh, fresh and spicy to chew on tonight. Uh, but Facebook said, we are not going to let this man do this, which means that now, as best as I, I can understand it, uh, on Facebook, during the 2020 election campaign, Politicians will be able to lie in political ads unless they are not allowed to. And we'll see what that means. Yeah. Clara, what should Facebook do here? Oh, wow. I'm the one being grilled with the final question. Well, you have the microphone, so. Yeah, you know, I, I do think that ad policy is really interesting because one reason in my hypothesis here of why there hasn't been a black and white li li line drawn is we can talk about what to do in the US, Facebook might have more context to what is real and what's fake, but if they're doing that in every single country around the world and they're thinking about a policy that can apply, they're expected to know every single political election, which I can't even keep track of. I think most Americans don't even know who the president of Colombia is, right? So I, I think that becomes really hard when you think about creating policies and when those policies apply, because then you're gonna get heads of governments who are saying, hey, you're doing this in America, do it here in the UK, and do it here now in Myanmar, right? So, so you know, and what you're getting at is like a part of what is uh, is driving this policy is that there's pro like probably no platform that it operates globally can understand every nuance of every election well enough to accurately police the truth value of political statements. Yeah, I would say even people on campaigns don't know what's true and what's fake anymore. I mean, they're just looking at Com, you know, content that they can use to target their opponents, right? It yeah, doesn't asked, matter if it's true, what is, yeah. What is, is it helpful? checking anymore? Yeah. I mean, do people have an operational process in place to really verify content that they receive, right? And that's a really interesting, vexing question yeah. I think a lot of people are grappling with. I mean, I, I feel like this leads us to a fairly dark vision of our current information sphere. Uh, do you have like a sort of overall level of optimism around like, humanity's ability to um, ingest like the speed of the internet and all that it enables and still maintain healthy democracies? 
Yeah, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually uh, push one of my favorite books is a friend of mine, Peter Pomeranz, who wrote a book called Everything is True and Nothing is Possible. It talks about the history of Russian disinformation, but I want you guys to sizzle on that statement first, because that is actually really dark of the future that Casey is painting, right? I, I think it's nothing is true and everything is possible. No, okay, nothing yes. is true and everything yeah. is possible. Yep, sorry about that. No, um, I, just, I, I, want, I want you to search it out. It's like an yeah. important book, yeah. Uh, so... So I wanted to mention that, but I do think I am fairly optimistic because uh, one of the biggest reasons why platforms have done so much yeah. in terms of pushing and starting to moderate content more and more, especially when it becomes problematic, has been governments. It has been all of you guys in this room and people speaking up to say, this is not acceptable. We don't want to see, Mercedes Benz doesn't want to see their advertisements in front of ISIS videos, right? And so there's... There's many different reasons, but you guys are all here in this room and people who use the internet every day, you guys play a critical role in what you choose to upload. If you decide to send that dick pic to someone else, right? Like someone else in the developing world is viewing that content and deciding if that's an acceptable piece of content or Only not. Only if it gets reported, you know, like consensual sharing of nude images probably will never, you know, reach Mark Zuckerberg's desk, but uh, you never know. Yeah, so I mean, I, you know, I, I want to be optimistic and I do think that there is a future in which we'll have more and more sophisticated tools that can be scaled uh, to not only large platforms but smaller ones to be able to minimize some of the human toll that is in place right now. I'm, I'm glad you bring that up because I want to make sure that's something that we spend a bit of time talking about. Okay. Um, it, it's, you know, uh, as Christy mentioned, this is something I've spent a lot of uh, time talking to folks about this year. Uh, it, and I'm curious because I know that your work, you know, intersects so closely with these issues. How have you had the chance to talk with moderators about uh, some of their experiences and maybe some of the long-term toll of looking at all of that nude imagery and, and the much worse stuff that uh, they have to look at? Yeah, so actually right before this, I was in London speaking on a panel with a former content moderator from Dublin. And, um, you know, he is actually suing Facebook right now. But a lot of the, the psychological trauma is without recognizing this as a field with unique circumstances. There hasn't been studies that have really said, hey, if you're looking at vulgar images for hours after hour after hours, you could get PTSD, right? There are medical conditions that develop and when companies are trying to respond and they don't have the, the right kind of HR support on site, it really leads people to have mental uh, illnesses and, and, and trauma that is induced with other types of trauma they get in life. And so that's unfortunately what happens. You have um, people that are in countries like Dublin that moderate certain types of content. And you also have uh, people in very worse conditions in the Philippines. There's a documentary called The Cleaners that covers this, where you have 21-year-old girls that have this glorified image of one day working for a large company that go into these vendor roles thinking there is a hierarchy of moving up when they're on a very short-term, lowly paid contractual basis. They think they've been hired at Google or Facebook in some cases. Like they think this is the first step toward yeah, you know, maybe becoming a project manager or something. They think there's an up, upward trajectory. Yeah. And, and they're starting to expose themselves to content that they've never seen, right? Yeah. And these are some of the worst images you can imagine of um, you know, beheadings and slaughterings. And a lot of times, most companies weren't quite sure how to even start filtering uh, what to outsource and what not to. And those are operational practices that I do believe that technology can help design and minimize the trauma of. And Facebook actually did start to do this a few months ago. They, they started to test the process in which images would be blurred to moderators, yep. at least certain types of images. So I am optimistic, but I do think that uh, there needs to be more to be done to elevate this field, to recognize it as a profession and something where people at the lowest rung of this professional space can, can have ability to say, I'm gonna keep working and I know how to improve the process and also have a voice that goes all the way up, not something that hits the vendor, you know, the CEO of the vendor company and never transpires past that. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't tell you how many moderators have told me that they, they have frustrations, but they feel like they cannot express them to the vendor because they will be retaliated against, but also they do not have a direct line to, the, uh, to, to, to what they always call the client. Um, yeah, you know, what, one thing that uh, I have, whenever, I've, I've talked to like more than 100 moderators at this point, and one of the things I always ask them is, uh, what did, they tell you this job was gonna be like before you took it. And uh, in some cases, uh, they were very upfront and they said, look, you're gonna look at a lot of stuff. Uh, and I, what I would say the majority of the cases, they seem to underplay it a little bit uh, and they might say something like, um, oh, you know, like you might see some disturbing content, you know? Um, 
when in reality it's going to be a daily thing. Um, and a lot of the moderators I have spoken with have uh, later been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder or secondary traumatic stress disorder, and um, almost every moderator uh, that I've ever spoken with has told me that there is at least one video uh, that they can't unsee. It's almost always a video, uh, and I will uh, just ask them to describe it for me. And it is, and the reason I ask them to do it is because it is amazing to me the vividness of the detail in which they can describe this thing that they will now, you know, never be able to unsee. Uh, in America, most of these folks are being paid about twenty-eight thousand dollars a year. Um, it's about eighteen dollars. I'm sorry, it's about fifteen dollars an hour. Uh, Facebook uh, said this year that it would increase that to eighteen dollars an hour. Uh, YouTube currently pays uh, between eighteen and eighteen fifty uh, in America, and then of course people around the world are making much less. Um, but back to the hiring thing uh, for a second, they don't ask these people whether they might have any uh, mental health reason not to take this job. And that seems uh, wrong to me, right? If you have a history of anxiety and depression, uh, if you have a history of abuse or trauma, and your job is there to look at abuse or trauma all day, like you can imagine uh, at least wanting to know that up front, right? And at least wanting to know with what frequency am I going to see these images? And what mental health resources are you going to make available to me? And if I get fired for this job because I wasn't able to apply your standards uh, to your you know, level of uh, accuracy, uh, are you going to provide any resources for me after I'm out of a job and have PTSD? And the answer to that question, by the way, is no in every single case across the board. So to me, that like there is this mental health crisis in content moderation that still remains under discussed. I'm just going to tell one more story, and, and I'll stop uh, lecturing. Uh, when I wrote my second piece about content moderation this year, uh, I got to talk with um, uh, a man at Facebook who worked on um, what they call resilience programs, sort of everything that the company does to try to promote the well-being of their contractors. And this person was very sincere, clearly hardworking. I believe he cared a lot. I believe he's doing a lot of good in, in that organization. Um, but I asked him about this work that they were having 30,000 people do around the world. That's at Facebook alone. I said, how much is too much graphic content to show a person? You know, like what, like what is too, like do you have any standard for, I don't know, how, how many beheadings would you make someone watch in a day or a week or ever, right? And he said he didn't know, and it, the, his quote to me was, if there's one thing that keeps me up at night, it's that question, how much is too much? And I just thought, it freaks me out that you don't know. You know, it, it, just, it freaks me out that we do not know the answer to that question because, again, we have 30,000 people doing that job around the world. And by the way, a lot of people have done that job and have gotten fired or quit after six months or a year because they couldn't handle it, right? So uh, I, I'll stop uh, ranting. Uh, but, I, did, yeah. I did want to shout out to this guy. His, uh, his March piece on content moderation was the reason why a lot of content moderators got a 3 to $4 raise. Yeah, that you was know, pretty this cool. Is the, yeah. This is the oh, amazing part about thank journalism you. to really expose... Yeah some of the, the conditions. That was pretty dope. Um, yeah, uh, I'll be happier when the raises go into effect, though. So it still hasn't happened for the <laughs> most part. Uh, I know, because the moderators are like on my signal every day being like, yeah, still no, still no raise yet. But uh, anyway, um, what, what other things, or like as you look out at this field, what else do we need to be doing for the moderators, for the individuals who are doing this work? Yeah, um, I think there needs to be a lot more sophistication in who we talk about in the field of content moderation and trust and safety, right? There are people that are not these vendors that are in sophisticated roles at companies that are at the VP level. So a few years ago, there was a journalist that said, who are the two most powerful women that control free speech around the world? And they named Monica Bickert, who's a VP of content at Facebook, and someone named Juniper Downs, who does you know, general counsel at YouTube and Google. But you know, I want you guys to pause and think there for a second because there's a lot of very, very tricky rules that a number of people who have been in this field for 10, 15 years, really thinking through complicated processes, they've had to think through. And some of them actually have been that first person who's dealing with spam straight out of college at YouTube in the early days. There's pioneers of trust and safety teams, and there is progression. And there are a lot of people that care a lot about this profession that come from all different backgrounds, from people that come from three-letter agencies that are dealing with threat intelligence when it comes to Russian influence campaigns. Those are really hard to outsource out. There's people that have gone through 
uh, legal training that are lawyers, and they are making really interesting decisions on what is allowed and what isn't, right? So, and, and, and so there are a lot of people that work in this field of trust and safety, and that also needs to be elevated and recognized for the right operational processes to come in effect, so that when new companies are dealing with different types of content, they know how to actually set up the right operational structure. Perhaps outsourcing is not something that they need to do. I mean, there could be tools that can help with mitigation of a lot of these risks that can come much earlier stage. And there might be you know, wellness and wellness policies and standards that can be developed so that you know, the ethical standards of actually, when you outsource, uh, there is a certain barrier you have to meet. Um, so those are really, you know, I want to kind of go towards a more positive direction. That's why I asked, yeah. Yeah, but, but, but those are the things that I think are incredibly important when you think about how to uplift people that work in this profession. Yeah. Yeah. Just like privacy, you know, 15 years ago, people didn't consider it a profession. They were privacy advocates, and now there's chief privacy officers at every company, and there's legislation coming. If we think about legislation, there's really two effects. The, no, the first effect is you're gonna get companies to moderate more, and this professional field is going to grow. But you're also combining this push for privacy with a push for moderation. How do you actually moderate well? You're going to have to dig into user privacy. And so this is a tug of war that we're constantly struggling with alongside this third category of advertisement policy. How does a company upkeep its revenue, stay afloat, while managing everything else? So it's a very complicated ecosystem that isn't just do this and do that, free speech or not. I mean, there's a number of factors at play that most companies today are grappling with. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think that is all uh, very well said and very true. Uh, one thing that you said struck me just about the need for some standards in this industry. And there's this thing that I'm tripping on right now, because right now I'm working on a story about content moderation at Google. I'm telling you that because Google already knows. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, but, uh, but, I'm, but this is a good thing about Google. So at Google, uh, if you're a moderator at YouTube, uh, you are given... Uh, in addition to an hour-long lunch, which is unpaid, you're given two hours of what they call wellness time. So out of your day, you're only working six hours, right? Um, and during those two hours, you can maybe decompress if you saw something that was really terrible. At Facebook, you get nine minutes, okay? So that, to me, what that speaks to, other than just the obvious injustice of it, is how young this industry is, right? That there are no professional standards around this kind of thing. And actually, one of the reasons I like writing about it is because if you do that compare and contrast, you can try to get the various actors to rise to the standard right, of their competitors. So I would be shocked if five years from now, the average Facebook moderator still only had nine minutes of wellness time. Yeah, and, and I mean, Casey, I would love for you to expand on that a little bit more. Yeah. Why hasn't this issue been spotlighted before? Because you know? well, it wasn't happening to white people in America. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's like a very true thing. Like, there's been a lot of uh, reporting and academic research on content moderation uh, that came before I started writing these stories. Um, uh, frankly, when I got the first signal message uh, from a, a Facebook moderator in Phoenix, Arizona, um, I, had, I didn't really understand the degree to which um, content was being moderated uh, in, in the United States. This was uh, it's just about to be the one year anniversary of this happening to me. And most of this stuff had only happened after the 2016 election, right? So 2016 happens, everyone freaks out, Facebook starts scaling up these programs, YouTube started doing the same thing, and they finally had reason to bring these folks to America. Of course, they weren't doing it here because it's more expensive to do it here, right? Um, but you know, Claire and I were talking before the event, and the, 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 what we call the deck, which is the little uh, line after the headline on any story you see on The Verge uh, or, or other uh, digital media sites, we call the deck. Uh, the deck for my story, The Trauma Floor, was The Secret Lives of Facebook Moderators in America. And like, I knew that it was the in America that was going to sell the story, because if you tell Americans that their friends and neighbors like work for Facebook, but through a contractor, and they're paid $28,000 a year, and they're getting PTSD, and they only get nine minutes a day to take a break after they see something horrible, you can just get people's attention in a different way. So, you know, just as the world is full of economic injustice uh, in, in, you know, so many areas, uh, we have seen that, that same thing play out here. 
Yeah, and I think there's a budding field of research as well accompanying this, right? Without research to really prove it out, it's really hard for this advocacy to take effect. Yeah. Right? And there's more people that have been studying the secondary effects of trauma from, from content online. And people have also asked us in other categories, right? Will my kids shoot guns if they're playing video games that are violent all the time? And so I do believe and optimistically believe that we can pull this information together in a way that can show the trauma that comes from this, we can create policies and we can create standards that can help uplift everyone working in this field. That feels like a great place to stop and take some questions. Hey, thanks Clara and Casey for an amazing talk. I hope this question is about SharePoint, by the way. <laughs> 2003. Um, Related-ish. Um, <laughs> I, I was wondering like, what your views are on how much this is like a people problem and how much this is a technology problem, especially, I guess, if we start thinking of like, like live streaming platforms like Periscope, and if someone is like, live streaming something that all their friends can see live, like, how quickly can humans really respond to content moderation? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's a great question. I think that the biggest problem is speed. Like, speed is what kills on the internet, right? And speed, I think, is more of a technology problem than it is a people problem, but it's a people problem too. I, I think you sort of have to work on both. Um, yeah, Clara? Yeah, um, I can give a very specific example if you want to hear. Um, during the Christchurch live shooting, that 17-minute live video, Facebook usually puts a human in a loop process when it comes to content detection. But in this case, because that video went so viral, it was shared millions of times in the first hour alone, and then on secondary file sharing sites, they needed to completely use machines to be able to take detection at scale. But they also had to make sure that they weren't taking down media and journalists reporting alongside that. And so there are operational tactics that have been built that also mimic the early days of online streaming of child pornography, which is illegal, that come into effect that this field has been developing to determine how do we minimize the speed. But the second thing I did also want to talk about is all of you guys and the role of you guys in this room. So there's one thing that Facebook put out that I thought was quite good, and there was this graph that they published, which shows um, this, uh, this line of acceptable policy and unacceptable policy. And the closer you get to this line, the more curious humans are about that content, right? How many of you guys actually wanted to watch that 17 minute long video? And when you search for that video, the KPIs that you're developing in that product actually tell the system that this is something that users want to see. This is something that's popular content. This is something that should be upranked you know, on search. Oh, yeah, and so, yeah. so that's the complicated part is that the more curious you are about graphic violent content, I personally was too, but I know how to find it if I wanted it, right? Um, it also plays a huge role in that content spreading. So um, there are operational processes that are really important um, that you have to do because the second you don't immediately take it down with speed, it's going to spread and it's going to be impossible to, to take down anymore. Yeah. So. Oh. Hi, thank you so much. I'm curious about if we go a step backwards, how much you think this is maybe a crisis in diversity? So Facebook famously hired a diversity person when they reached 25,000 employees or something like that. And I read a really interesting article which was like, imagine that you're a young woman in Ghana and you wake up and you read this uh, article about how there are mass shootings in the US and you're so upset and distraught about this that you decide to relocate to the US with no context of the culture and any of the socioeconomic and why gun laws and decide that you, you know you want to solve this problem. That was more a take on international development. But do you think if in the early stages of Facebook there was someone there who represented a perspective and who had witnessed a beheading or, or who had witnessed something violent or who had, you know, a different perspective that they could have I feel like letting them off the hook really easy um, by saying, you know, it's developed so quickly, I think it's partly because there was such a limited range of perspectives to begin with. Oh, you want me to take it on? Well, I, I, I did want to call out something. I just didn't want to be the guy who was always talking first, like after the questions. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, we can rotate. <laughs> um, so, by the way, I did want to preference that uh, if I say anything that you disagree with, I do have a twin sister, and she's my deep fake. And so, if you don't agree with me, it's not me, it's my deep fake. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I did want to say one of, one of the pioneers in trust and safety, she's actually at Twitter, her name's Del Harvey, uh, and she's a vice president there, and she actually started off her career um, in child exploitation, and that's when she started to think... Well, like working on it, working not on doing it. Working on child exploitation, yeah. not, not actually yeah. being part of that cycle. But 
Thank you so much. I don't want to spread misinformation here. Yeah. Not a lot of careers in child exploitation, thank God. I know. I, I, yeah. I make the mistake of saying, you know, I work on terrorist content online. It's pretty good. It makes me sound bad, right? <laughs> so, so, I mean, a lot of people that have been in these alternative roles in different points in their life, they really do think about safety in a different way. And Dell was one of the first people who really pushed to say, we need, like, we need to verify people online because people are going to be pretending to be other people. And yeah. nobody thought that that would happen in the dawn of the internet, right? Yeah. Um, and think about where we are today. Without that blue check mark, how much there could be misrepresentation of what's happening. So I don't know if that fully answers your questions, but a lot of people that have been the most thoughtful in this space, at least on the industry side, they have had that on the ground experience in some regard. Um, and they've been able to shape a lot of product development in that direction through those experiences. But you're also right to say that there's a lot of people that unfortunately don't have that exposure, a lot of companies that don't have that exposure. And so when they are thinking about where to expand and what to do, um, it's a very limited perspective that only represents the Silicon Valley and, and this bubble where technology is the answer to everything in this world, right? Uh, and, and when you think about the sort of stereotypical Silicon Valley startup, uh, it's you know mostly dudes in a room, and the first content policy is usually like written on the back of a piece of like printer paper, and it's usually like no murder, no porn, and then it just sort of like gets like fractally more complicated from there. Um, but like no, their first hire is is not typically some somebody who, you know, has expertise on, like, civil society issues. Uh, and, you know, one of the things I think we both believe in is, like, this kind of stuff needs to be taken seriously um, much sooner in a company's life cycle. I was excited to hear you mention this idea of standard setting because that's what I'm in the business of doing and on, on tech policy. And nice. I'm just curious about... Um, where you guys think the state of disclosure is on this topic right now? You know, there are these transparency reports that companies are putting out. And I was just kind of curious as to, you know, where are they? Are they is it good enough? Like, what, what are they missing? And, you know, kind of what would a standard for, for something like this look like? Yeah, uh, transparency reports I think are great, uh, uh, and that's been a case where they're like the, I don't I don't know who did the first one, but man, like the second one came pretty soon after that. Uh, so it's been a very effective way of, of bringing attention to these issues. I think Facebook's ad library is like probably the single most important feature they have released in the past year. It's been an incredible resource for journalists and academics to understand uh, our democracy, even though it has many fault, uh, flaws, and even though you know researchers are mostly unhappy with it. Um, so these things are, are really good, um, but there are gaps. Like it's something I wrote about in my newsletter today. Uh, we don't have per country hate speech reports. Uh, that's expensive. Facebook is going to have to spend like real money on that. But I would like to know uh, how much hate speech they caught in Myanmar this year and how it compared to last year. Yeah, I mean, and, and maybe just to add one more thing, we can get other questions. Um, there also isn't a consistent way to really compare transparency reports from one company to another, right? And that comes down to standards. It's to say, what is the state of hate speech in America? Or what is the state of hate speech in, in Myanmar? And today, it's no longer just one player. It's many players in those countries. And to be able to do that broad-based analysis, because I did want to emphasize content, when it stays on one platform, spreads to smaller ones. And it's actually the most harmful content are actually on smaller platforms platforms that have no means of moderation. So it could be, you know, what I just explained earlier, a um, just paste it file sharing site that has one person running it. And what happens is that link gets shared on Facebook where it has that reach, it has that volume, and reaches people, and then goes to a messaging app um, where that link doesn't get taken down even though Facebook removes it, right? So it's an ecosystem approach in which there has to be measures and standards that um, all companies follow in some consistency for us to really do more with content. Otherwise, the second it gets taken down, it's going to be re-uploaded somewhere else. Yeah. These questions are all great, by the way. Yeah. Fantastic. And we're in San Francisco. We have some smart people in this Love room. Love San Francisco. Yeah. Hi, thank you. So you talked about sort of the political and security dynamics in Myanmar, and we've kind of all agreed that both the government and tech companies are behind on a lot of issues around content moderation. Obviously, Facebook could have benefited from the knowledge of government in the situation of Myanmar and in many other violent contexts around the world. To what degree do you think that government and private sector are going to start working together? There's obviously a lot of tension between the two and, and how can we sort of facilitate uh, more partnership? 
I feel like you're in a great position to answer oh, that. Oh, man. Well, you know, I think the first thing is, I'm going to go back to what we said before, consistency and standards, right? There have been governments that share with companies this Excel spreadsheet of data points in very different ways. And they maybe get 100 of those per country. And the question is, how do you, how do you start dealing with that in a format that is collaborative and useful, right? How do you think about um, the policies that already have been developed in certain companies uh, and how that maps to how governments are thinking about their own policies and what is allowed? And unfortunately, there are countries like what happened in Sri Lanka right after the terrorist attack earlier this year in which governments feel like they are powerless in this online space. They are powerless and they end up censoring complete services from users accessing it because they feel like they can't do anything. So it is really, really hard, and I think there needs to be understanding, and there also needs to be more technical expertise at governments all around the world to be able to speak the same language and to understand how to have better synergies with companies. Because without that, I mean, I joined US government primarily for the reason of bridging that gap, but many other governments around the world they're still on SharePoint, I don't know, 1995? I don't know. But it's, it's really important. We have to make sure both are upkept. Yeah, um, I, I basically totally agree with that. Uh, so I'll just take the opposite perspective, though, which is, I think is worth sharing, which is we are at a time when democracy is in decline, authoritarianism is on the rise, governments want more access to more data. Uh, there are a lot of efforts around the world to prevent us from using encryption, even in just one-to-one -one messages between friends and family. That can have a chilling effect on activism and organizing. Uh, and so while there are plenty of areas where I do want to see governments and tech companies working closer together, like um, uh, the National uh, Center for um, Missing and Exploited Children, I think is a, like, a wonderful non-governmental organization which has really productive relationships with Facebook and the other big tech platforms, um, I also want them to resist uh, you know, needless intrusions onto our, our civil liberties. So you know, as with so much of what we talked about today, it's a tricky balance with impossible trade-offs. Okay, so I haven't heard either of you talk about targeting. The, 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 the most frightening aspect of the Cambridge Analytica activity in the 2016 election was the fact that they were the precisely target vulnerable populations and hit ads directly to them. How does that affect the overall content moderation problem if we can be that precise and hit people with, um, with uh, yeah. disinformation that so easily? So like one, one area where I sort of diverge from some others in the tech press corps is like, I don't think that Cambridge Analytica really had secret mind control powers where like, because they know my age and like where I live and my demographics, like they were able to convince me to vote for another person. And I, I don't think they had an outsized effect really uh, on any reason. What I do think is that uh, targeting capabilities enable politicians to have uh, essentially infinite different conversations with every um, person in the populace, which makes it essentially for like impossible for us to understand like what we would traditionally think of as a campaign, right? If uh, Trump is saying one thing to soccer moms and another thing to NASCAR dads, and then just sort of infinitely divide that, uh, like campaigns get really weird. So there's a, a movement uh, inside Facebook actually to get rid of micro-targeting. Like, like some executives like at very high levels have uh, said, you know, if we're going to have political advertising, can we at least create a sort of minimum uh, size of people that you're able to advertise to, right? So if you're gonna take out an ad, you have to show it to at least 10,000 people. And the idea is that will drag politicians back to the center, right? If they can't say the most inflammatory thing to every, like, you know, to every individual like person in America, uh, maybe we can restore like something approaching the norm. So I, uh, I don't understand all of the second order consequences of that. So that's something that I wanna learn more about, but I do think it's something that's worth exploring. Yeah, I can quickly answer and then we can go to more questions. Um, my opinion, very similar to Casey, is behavioral targeting has been happening in even more sophisticated ways in the advertising industry for years. If any of you guys work here in marketing, you would say that you know this kind of psychological targeting, a lot of major companies use it. It's not unique. But what was different was in Cambridge Analytica, you had access to so many users' data in a way that was at scale, right? And that's why a lot of people are pushing against monopolies happening in the social media space because once you have that much information, you get so much more sophistication than ever before. Um, Facebook also, I don't think, really thought through their advertising policy even in the early days. And I still remember a time where I could buy an ad to say, I want to um, target people that have tendencies to like ISIS, right? 
And you know, there might be keywords related to that. What but were you selling them? <laughs> no, no, no. This is just me ma playing around. Yeah. I mean, I. I'm, yeah. No. You're, yeah. Totally. But, yeah. but it's it, it's kind of crazy that like you have to think about all these scenarios today if you're creating an, an you know ad targeting platform. Yeah. And Facebook, unfortunately, because they have so much access to data, it's so easy to do um, average audience insights and tar micro targeting of anyone. And most of the time, people don't realize they're being targeted, right? With Cambridge Analytica, it was like, what pr Disney princess would you most like to be? By would show of hands, how many people here are wearing something that they bought because of an ad they saw on social media? All right. So that's how micro-targeting works. Yeah. And most of the time, you're not knowing you're targeted. You're, you're not, so. Yeah. These questions are great. Are you guys happy let's to take some going. more? Yeah, let's yeah? keep going. <laughs> okay. Hi, um, Claire, this is about something you said earlier. Um, so do you think companies actually have an incentive to promote and like encourage career development among content moderators? Because it seems there is an incentive for them to just use these people um, to like train AI and machine learning systems to do the content moderation for them um, and just maintain that kind of like low paid, like kind of just the human element of that. Yeah, I, um, I think it's, I think it's it absolutely, I think absolutely, they should, but you know the reality is, the reality is, I do think that the content space is getting more and more complicated. And so, if there is no sophistication in it, then it becomes really hard for companies to think about solutions. You can you can hire um, hourly workers, but you're not going to be able to think about um, more and more solutions as user generated content grows. And that's not just the major social media platforms. We're talking about dating apps that have to think about this, right? We're thinking about platforms like Airbnb. There's, and, and even you know, Lyft and Uber, they have teams of trust and safety that have to deal with threats they've never had to think about before. So there is absolutely career progression. I think the second area that's gonna be an interesting push is regulation. The second you start regulating, how many of you guys who work on engineering teams had to think about GDPR and the repercussions of that and spend hours on that, right? So regulation is coming whether we like it or not. And there's going to be more and more people in demand. And the question is, how do we actually build the right structure so that people are not recreating the wheel when they're thinking about trust and safety? We can learn from our mistakes and have comprehension and have sophistication, have standards that to say, this is someone that is exceptional in this profession in policymaking in the internet world, right? Who are the diplomats on the internet? And, and how should they think through? What is the training that they should have to be able to have better insights on um, what is happening in countries all around the world, cultural contexts, et cetera? The same way offline diplomats have to think through these things and go through rigorous language training. So I do think that absolutely there's a space for that. And, we need to you know, all uplift this profession if we want the internet to be a better and healthier place. Hello. Um, we talked a bit about earlier at the beginning the kind of history of content moder moderation. Why is it that volunteers are sort of out of vogue anymore? Like Wikipedia, for example, actually has a great content moderation system, kind of tiers of moderation, panels and all this stuff. Instead of relying on a small number of people to have kind of this divine insight into morality, like if we can crowdsource it from a large number of people, it sounds like that was the right solution. What's wrong about that interpretation? Well, I mean, in a way, uh, like, content moderation still is mostly volunteer because the way it starts is somebody sees something on a platform and then they report it, right? So it really is, I mean, like how many people in here have reported a post somewhere, right? So it's like we're all volunteers. Um, when you see that ex-girlfriend and your one-year anniversary on Facebook come up yeah. again and your image, yeah, you're just like, I don't want that. But spam. that's not violation of anything. <laughs> right. I, I think, like, the question, though, is, um, <laughs> like, in, in your view... I mean, like you've heard the like the trade-offs that we've talked about today between like you know security and freedom and all of this stuff. It's like how how do you get a, an army of volunteer moderators to one show up, keep showing up to do the work, and then two um, accurately enforce a policy globally, right? It's like yeah, oh, like a jury. So uh, so Periscope does. Have you seen this on Periscope? Periscope does this. 
Yeah, so um, if you, uh, I know a lot of folks aren't on Periscope anymore, but uh, if you open up like a big stream where, uh, you know, someone is, you know, maybe liable to be harassed, um, somebody will report a comment and then Facebook will then show that, I'm sorry, <laughs> Twitter will then show that comment to three or four other people watching the stream and say, is this abusive or is this okay? And you tap and the jury votes. And if the jury votes, it's okay, it stays, like it comes out. Yeah, so um, I, what I guess what I would say is like, Let's experiment with that more and see where it goes. This is great. Did y'all hear this? So, so uh, this gentleman raised a great point, which is maybe you're watching a stream of the president, and uh, you know somebody says something that is maybe critical of the president, and then all the president supporters then vote it down, and they say this is abusive, right? Uh, so again, like once it gets into these these uh, ideological areas or like areas that are hyper partisan, uh, it becomes complicated to build these systems. W one of my other preferred uh, solutions is just what if uh, all of this were a lot smaller and like people just organized into communities and we didn't have to all share one giant room with every single human, uh, you know, <laughs> sort of arguing with each other until we die. <laughs> Yeah, I did want to add a little bit of sophistication to what was just said. I thought and it was that, very sophisticated myself, but it, go on. It was. Yeah. Um, a, a good friend of mine, Camille Francois, he, he, she puts it this way. There's really three types of things you look for for how you assess content. The first is actually who is the actor, right? Is this a Russian troll? And if it's a Russian troll, then his Periscope example, oh, you know, they're trying to sway the content decision some way. Yeah. The second is actually behavior. So what is the kind of behavior? And so when you think about a bot attack, on that Periscope's example. That's also behavior mechanisms that you can see. And the third is actually the substance of the content, right? Is that a deep fake or is it something else? And there's different policies that have to weigh in there as well. So it really is important when we talk about this field and talk about processes to be very specific in the what. That's a great point. I'm glad I feel like I'm a content moderator choosing the questions. <laughs> you so are. much pressure. Um, there's a lot of hands over here. How about you? Thank you. Um, so Casey, you started to hit on this actually directly um, and talking about kind of the, the size of these platforms. And then, um, you know, Claire, you talked about this earlier as well with kind of this crisis point where it just gets so big and things move so fast that it's hard to deal with it. Um, and culture is messy. It evolves quickly. And you look at like Pepe the Frog was a benign meme and then it was racist and then it was not in China again, right? So yeah. I'm curious kind of as user generated content gets easier and easier or so far, it's still getting easier if you see companies actually introducing friction into that process and making it harder to get stuff out or make it go viral or let's say Elizabeth Warren gets her way and you know, Instagram gets spun off and things start getting more, more balkanized again. Um, do you see that kind of that trend reversing and getting slower or harder to get content out there? And if so, what are, what are the downsides to that? Uh, really interesting question. You know, I was thinking the, the platform that has like worked the hardest in the past decade not to make things go viral of like any real scale has been Instagram because they refuse to introduce a, what we might call a regram button, right? If you see something in the feed, you can't one tap share it to all of your followers. And there's like pretty good evidence that this was helpful in the 2016 election, that it was less useful to Russians than Facebook itself was because, you know, on Facebook, there's no friction. You can like sort of share with everyone. And yet look at what has happened to Instagram in the years since. You can now share any feed post as a story, right? So now when I open up my Instagram stories, I see a lot of feed posts. Like effectively, they have introduced a regram button. Why have they done that? Well, because it made the engagement go up. What are the incentives on every single social platform? It's to make the engagement go up. Why do they need engagement? Because the longer the eyeballs are on the platform, the more money the companies make so that they can reinvest it into people to clean up all the content that people are using to recruit people into ISIS. So, until we change those incentives, I fear it's all just going to push toward virality and engagement. Yeah, um, and, and, and I think, you know, there's a, there's a quote, free speech is not free reach, right? And so it's a debate that we have to think about because a lot of people, when there is more restriction and friction, they leave platforms and they'll go to another place that has more free speech, right? And that's why you see a lot of conservatives leave Facebook and are on Gab and other sites in which there is more toxic content. And sometimes they are stuck in more eco chambers. Um, so, so that is a you know, really, really hard problem that people have to think about in this space. Um, I, and I think the second part is really around what Casey said. You know, what is what is that safety repercussion of not letting something go super viral? And um, you know, this was written about this 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 week alone around Facebook for the first time is thinking about moderating its news, 
Um, I don't know if you want to yeah. talk a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, so uh, Facebook has a new news tab that it's going to be rolling out. It's, uh, it's uh, paying publishers uh, fees for work that they've already created to just um, have a home on Facebook where you can see uh, mostly pretty high quality news. Um, and uh, this is something I've wanted Facebook to do for a long time. It was very controversial because they're including Breitbart in it, uh, which has like, done some pretty awful stuff um, and is not my idea of uh, trusted or high quality news. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, on, on that, I would say I'm optimistic. The most important thing is Facebook is handing at least some publishers millions of dollars, which those publishers can then just invest in journalism and uh, you know, self-interested here. But I think we need a lot more journalism in this world. Yeah, and I did want to stress why this is so important. Most people don't realize this, but Pew Internet did a study last year which said two-thirds of Americans and two-thirds of people rely on Twitter, Facebook, and Reddit for the main source of their news, meaning what they see comes through their feeds, through who they follow. And that's not a representative view when you think about pulling up an old-school newspaper with your cup of coffee in the morning and reading things in a very standardized way. And so um, that's why this space is so important because there used to be a time and place, Huffington Post used to allow hundreds and thousands of contributors that were non-vetted to write news stories. And so it became a place where anyone could say they're a journalist. And that's also what had led to a lot of the clickbaity titles in 2016 in which people could use these you know, headlines and say that they were news and get a lot of click-through rates that were actually funding a lot of teenagers in Macedonia. There's a great article on this if you want to read deeper. Um, but there is a whole business model around fake news and fake advertising that continues to drive in a circle if we don't fix the incentive model. Yeah, like, like just one more thing I would say about that is like, you know, I, I worked at newspapers for a long time. I think newspapers are great. They're also very flawed. But the cool thing about getting your news from like a newspaper or what I would consider a mainstream publisher is you're not getting your news from like the 20 angriest people in America, <laughs> you know? It's like, just like, just find people who are somewhat dispassionate and see if uh, you don't come away with a more nuanced understanding of the issues. Hey, all right, so uh, Casey, you briefly touched on end-to-end -end encryption before. Um, there's a big ongoing debate right now in our country around end-to-end -end encryption. Our, our current US Attorney General recently commented on it uh, around putting backdoors in encryption. Um, I think one of the valid, potentially valid criticisms of end-to-end -end encryption is that content moderation is impossible, yeah. right? Um, and so I wanted to get uh, both of your thoughts a little bit more on that kind of the balance between encryption versus moderation. By any, this is a, re, a long shot, but have you seen Alex Stamos's pyramid? Okay, I, uh, I wish I could pull it up, but it's basically he set up this pyramid where it's like the fewer people that a piece of information is shared between, the more protection that should have. And so under that view, you and I should always have the right to exchange a one-to-one -one encrypted message. Now, you and I might be terrorists, and we might use this platform to plan terrorism, and that would be very bad. But on balance, many millions of people would be able to have free and open conversations um, that you know I personally think are valuable for a civil society. Now, the question uh, is, what happens when you go up the pyramid, right? Uh, on WhatsApp, for example, for a long time, you could uh, forward a message to many people, and as soon as you forward it, that message would lose its center of origin. So if I want to flood India, let's say, with terrible rumors, um, I can do that, and there is no link back to me that I sent it in the first place, and it's end-to-end -end encrypted, right? So that's a place where I would draw a line. I would say, let's not enable forwarding on, on, on um, encrypted messaging apps. So I am strongly in support of encryption, and I think there are some hard questions about exactly where you want to draw the line, but for me, it's generally about how much reach are you going to give that, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and the, there's actually a lot of studies about this, actually, when ISIS was at its peak using Twitter for a long time. And some people might say, now ISIS is off Twitter. It's now all on Telegram, which was a main coordination channel. But if you did look at the data, it did minimize the amount of people that were stumbling Twitter that reached an ISIS recruiter, right? And so to Casey's point, I do think that um, there is a rule when you minimize reach to minimize harm. And there's no perfect in this world of that. There's always going to be people that find backdoors, and you know, they're going to do it over blockchain, the buzzword of this, you know, year, right? So. 
That's right. Please don't plan, if you take one thing away from tonight, please do not plan terrorism on the blockchain. Okay, um, I don't want to end there, so let's take one more question. Let's, all right. <laughs> um, this gentleman, oh no, you no, already had a they, question. No, no, no. Um, how about you over here? Uh, so you talked about uh, the ad library and um, the new ad policies in, on Facebook, and I work for an environmental nonprofit, and since this rolled out, it's been very difficult to run ads. All the ads are flagged as political, and uh, I kind of like wanted to hear your perspective on that com compared to like what politicians can run ads, how they can do it, and even like compared to like companies like Shell or, or Exxon or running ads and that are fueling climate change and in this time of the year of the planet now. Yeah, so, the, uh, so after 2016, um, when we found out that Russians were running ads like, you know, under the name of, you know, like Texans for a better Texas, uh, Facebook instituted a rule where if you want to do political advertising, you have to register. This requires that you get a local address. They send a postcard to it. It contains a code. Uh, and the hope is that this increases the integrity of the information environment because we've now verified who this person is. So if they want to influence our politics, uh, we have some information about who they are. I think this is a positive thing. Um, they have had sort of many false positives since they rolled out this policy. Uh, there was a story in my newsletter, I think yesterday, uh, there was a, a campaign um, uh, for PrEP, like the anti-HIV drug. It was just like a sort of basic uh, public health awareness campaign and it got uh, you know, flagged as a political ad. Now, often these stories are written to say, uh, my ad was blocked, you know, Facebook wouldn't accept it. It's like, no, they wanted to know where your organization is based. Uh, to me, that's a trade-off I'm willing to make because what's important to me is I want there to be like integrity of the platform. I want to know who folks are. I understand it must be very frustrating. Um, it also seems like it's a one-time thing, like send the postcard. So, I, my, But my question, what I would like to know from you is, have you considered that and are there good reasons I'm not thinking of why you don't want to register as a political advertiser? Right, why are you held to a higher standard than Donald Trump is? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Public I mean, figures and yeah, to moderation. A lot of people are asking stuff. this question, and I think we're going to see these controversies break out over and over again until Facebook changes the policy. In fact, I mean, this is what I was saying earlier. It's like, I think Facebook might have changed the policy tonight. I can't wait to read Twitter after this is over and find out what the new policy is, right? But there's just going to be so much pushback for exactly these reasons. We are in this somewhat ridiculous circumstance where your nonprofit, which I'm sure is doing amazing things, is being held to the, you know, a higher standard than, than the president. Now, if I, if I, now I wanna be a, a good faith actor here and try to like fairly articulate Facebook's position, which I think would sort of be, it's, it's important that we know that Donald Trump is a liar and we should have a documented record of as many of his lies as possible so that we can share that information far and wide so that when voters go to the polls, they know the most possible information about their candidates. And we would rather not weigh in on the truth or falsehood, we would sort of rather let the democracy figure that out with the help of a free press. I think that that is basically what they would say. Now, why? They don't want to hold you to that standard. You know, I, maybe it's because you know smaller nonprofits typically are not the subject of national conversations, and so they want to um, do some of that work up front. But I don't know. Maybe there's somebody at Facebook here you can pull me aside afterwards and tell me the, a better answer. Um, I wish that this conversation could go on all night, and it probably could, but we are closing. We've been banned in seven minutes, <laughs> and, and also Casey, you have to check your Twitter, so we That's do have to, have to check. Twitter. Um, but thank you all for your amazing questions, and especially to Clara and Casey for this discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Y'all are great. I, I will say, if you guys have not had the chance to walk around this exhibit, yes. it's pretty incredible. Um, there is a camera downstairs that rates you know, how, how much you can easily find yourself online. I yeah. got a D, he got an A. Yeah. So I clearly have some OPSEC things to do. But you know, I, it's really amazing, and I highly encourage you guys to, to walk around. Christy has done an incredible job with yes. curation, and it'll help you think a lot more about this world. Yeah, so. super cool exhibit. Thanks for having us. Yep. Yeah.